Major problems with Tim's 26-game FSR DLSS comparison. Results are merely his own sleepy eye fatigued caffeinated NVIDIA biased opinion. Not your dumbest tweet mate. Until someone publishes a legitimate, objective image quality comparison using industry tools like VMAF or SSIM all definitive quality verdicts between FSR DLSS or XESS are nonsense. Bernie, you are not 18 anymore. If you did everything on that list, you would die. That wasn't challenge, challenge accepted. Hey guys, Trick here. I hope you're having a good one. Here on the channel, we talk all things tech, and lately we've been talking GPUs and PC handhelds, but I wanted to circle back and talk about some underlying technology. And judging by the tweets we had in the intro, VMAF is an incredibly useful tool, and a lot of you guys want to see an objective analysis between DLSS and FSR, and VMAF looks to be a pretty good tool for the job. So what exactly is VMAF? VMAF, or Video Multi-Method Assessment Fusion, is an objective full reference video metric that quantifies a subjective comparison between a reference clip and a distorted clip. In other words, it tries to predict if a viewer thinks a video clip looks good or not. Netflix and the University of Southern California originally developed this technique to help Netflix optimize its content distribution versus its users' quality expectations. Here on the channel, we looked at this a while back, and when it comes to raw rendering performance, the tool does exactly what it advertises, and it comes really close to some of my viewers' expectations. Luckily, VMAF has evolved a lot since then, and it has been integrated into many more tools, and it is just so much more easy to use and accessible. Let's also not forget that it has been integrated in some of the different FFmpeg branches, which just make it super fast to process video. On the surface, it looks like VMAP is a great tool for comparing two different video clips, but what do the numbers actually mean? The VMAP score is on a scale between 0 to 100. These values represent subjective quality thresholds, where a score of below 20 is considered bad, below 40 is considered poor, and under 60 is fair. For scores that are under 80, it's considered good, and anything above that is deemed excellent. So here's an example. You're sitting on your couch watching Netflix on a 55 inch screen about seven feet away from your TV. If you're watching Tiger King with a VMAF score of 85, most viewers would think that the quality is excellent. But if you're watching Cyberpunk Edge Runners with a score of 50, many viewers would think the quality is okay. It's not good. So it would appear that this type of tool would be a great asset when comparing different types of PC rendering technologies. Mm. Not exactly. The tool is only as good as its inputs, and in order to get a valid output, there is a whole long list of assumptions required to generate your VMAF score. First, the technique executes and calculates frame by frame. When encoding a standard video, this is straightforward since each frame is intact when encoded with a different codec. But when gaming, no two playthroughs are ever that perfect. If any type of visual effect, viewing angle, or object is slightly different from frame to frame, it will drastically impact your result. Even if you had everything lined up, many of the different overlays from a game will invalidate a frame comparison. Many in-game benchmarks provide this type of output for performance measurement purposes, but if one frame says 70 FPS and the other says 69, nice. That would invalidate the entire frame. With this type of precision requirement, many games are off the table. 3D Mark would be my starting point, but they list both FPS, frame number, and other types of text on the screen that would differ from run to run. Next, there are only so many games that support both FSR and DLSS for this type of comparison. There are just over 300 games that support third-party upscaling technologies, of those, even a smaller subset support both the latest versions of FSR and DLSS. Last, of course, is repeatability. Games like Witcher 3, No Man's Sky, and pretty much any standard game that's on the planet, they are just really difficult to replicate frame to frame as we mentioned before. Games with built-in benchmarks like Red Dead Redemption 2, Cyberpunk 2077, and Metro Exodus, they have those pesky FPS counters, so those aren't going to work. But in the end, I ended up choosing The Last of Us Part 1. 
The in-game cinematics does provide in-engine rendering and is reasonably repeatable. It's a very cinematic game, and we want the best quality possible from our upscalers. Tack on incredible textures and a visual stunning delivery, it's just a great fit. Sure, there's probably other games that have impressive cinematics, so let me know down in the comments if you want me to try those out. With that all out of the way, how do FSR and DLSS compare to a native experience? For this first stab at the video, I'm only going to be taking a look at two different clips. The first is a shorter sequence, with Joel walking across the screen about to curb stomp someone's face in. It's only a two second long clip, but I must ensure a consistent path across the samples. The second clip is much longer, with moderate motion, camera panning, and action within the sequence. It's about 7 seconds long, but it includes a scene change and a variety of textures, depth of field, and other challenging components for the upscalers. Let's get used to the output and take a look at 1080p with the slower scene. With very little motion across the screen, VMAF scores are very flat across the run. DLSS in quality mode scores a 76, balanced is 75, and performance 72. FSR scores are a bit lower but 74 in quality mode, 71 in balanced, and 70 in performance mode are effectively the same. These scores are considered good, but they're just shy of excellent when it comes to the VMAF scoring rubric. Those orange bars are interesting though. These are the standard deviation. With FSR, the VMAF score is slightly more noisy, meaning the resulting clip can dip into the 60s in all three of the modes. DLSS, on the other hand, only sees potential issues in performance mode. With rendering resolutions down to 540p, I think these type of results are excellent for both rendering technologies. But does this hold up in an action sequence? The increased motion and scene change highlight the issues with the reconstruction technologies, so let's dive in. With DLSS in quality mode, we maintain a similarly good result of 76, though our standard deviation can dip us into the 60s. In balance mode, we land shy of 70, sometimes dipping just above the 60 or good threshold. And yikes, performance mode is all over the place, landing just below a fair result and a significant swing in results. FSR has a similar pattern, but a bit worse result. In quality mode, we line up well with DLSS, and this validates my recommendations at 1080p, for both upscaling technologies stick to quality mode. The reduction in resolution in the balanced mode dips us to a 63 VMAF score, with swings moving us into the 40s in some instances. Performance mode scores a bit better than DLSS, but a score of 47 is just above fair, and it swings below that quite a bit of time. What do all these numbers actually mean? I've got some footage as well as the output from the tool, so let's take a look. I've had to capture this footage at 120 hertz in order to sync the segments as much as possible, so this first clip is running at a quarter speed. Here, Joel is slowly walking over to the bad guy, and overall, it's a standard static sequence. Now let's look at the visualized VMAF output with DLSS in quality mode. For each frame, VMAF takes chunks of the screen and compares it against the mastered frame, or the native experience, and calculates the areas it sees as discrepancies. The dark blue sections represent areas VMAF expects an excellent result, while lighter areas indicate that tool detects some issues. Without even seeing the original footage, you can clearly see a character moving across the screen. Pretty neat, huh? Let's overlay the result onto the footage. It is fascinating that the tool can differentiate Joel as he moves through the scene and the trouble areas align perfectly with where we expect issues with DLSS. Fences and power lines are tough spots for DLSS, and the VMAF result shows that. Texture definition also can show some issues, with the distant building, brick, and some of Joel's clothes representing lower VMAF scores. Now for the action scene. Robert is trying to run away from Tess, but she quickly responds with a quick smack with the metal pipe. Though it's not a super fast paced clip, enough motion and visual depth can cause some issues for upscaling tech. I'm also slowing this down to only about half speed here. With the visualized VMAF output of FSR in quality mode, 
we see clear outlines of our two characters, which track exceptionally well with the motion. As it opens up to the broader alley shot, we see the expected output from Joel's scene, but it's easier to identify that we're looking at a fence. With the overlay, take note of the smaller details of the scene. Robert's jacket zipper, face, fingers, the reflection in the ground, all of these are trouble spots for our upscalers. Now I can't show you all of the different clips from the matrix of testing that I've done, but I can provide you the output of the tool I'm using, MSUVQMT. It provides the aggregate frame by frame analysis for each of the different clips and prints it to the screen. With DLSS in the walking scene, there is a pretty distinct stratification of the modes, with quality mode in red hovering around the 76.5 mark, balanced in green around 75, performance blue around 72. Those scores confirm what we see with the bar charts from before. Now FSR with the same scene, we still get stratification, but it appears both balanced and performance mode trade blows green and blue respectively. Though why this is the case isn't clear, we should remember how similar the results were, and that matches our expectations in this type of scene. DLSS in the action scene shows peculiar behavior. With the same colors as before, DLSS quality and balanced mode appear much more stable across the run, while performance mode sees some significant degradation. The leading cause of this is the action. In that first downward slope, that's where Robert begins to run away from test. That huge crater we see is the scene change, and that's due to the reconstruction needing some frames to regroup, plus some possible synchronization issues between the clips. Once things slow down a little bit, quality and balance mode stabilize, though performance mode continues to struggle. In the exact same action sequence, FSR performs very similar to DLSS, but balance mode performs a bit worse. Both modes struggle significantly once fast motion is introduced, and it takes balance mode a bit of extra time to stabilize after the action. But who cares about 1080p? We all know that upscaling technology was originally marketed to help us get a better experience when running at 4K. In previous videos, I've determined that quality is pretty good even at DLSS in performance mode. And even FSR1 in performance mode is good enough in most cases. With the recent updates to VMAF's algorithms and models, 4K comparisons are also possible, but capturing footage for this is a bit more complicated. A single seven second clip is almost two gigabytes in size, and a two second clip is just shy of one gigabyte. Let's get Joel walking across the screen. At 4K with both upscaling technologies, we are scoring above 80, which means most people would see this as excellent. And that makes sense. Using a slower scene with much more pixels to use to upscale from, that should provide a better result than 1080p. Standard deviations are low as well, meaning our result is very stable. Moving into the action scene, scores do drop a bit, but overall, we are comfortably in the good category. Interestingly, FSR scores higher than DLSS with the VMAF score, though we're still in the same ballpark. Another note, both performance modes struggle quite a bit, and they fall more in line with quality and balance modes at 1080p. Of course, 4K footage is about four times as many pixels as 1080p, and with that, computation times are really long, so I'm only going to be able to show you guys one type of scene, and I think I should show you guys 4K with DLSS in performance mode while in the action scene. Each of the calculated blocks appear to be smaller with the larger resolution, but that isn't exactly the case. When stuffing 4K into a 1080p screen for YouTube, the image appears to be zoomed out from a native pixel-per-pixel -pixel display. In turn, each block is four times as small. As such, the characters in the scene are much more clearly defined, and the scene as a whole is analyzed a bit cleaner. However, the trouble spots from before still remain, but to a much smaller extent. Only the edges of the problematic areas appear to show artifacts. This means 4K reconstruction is more capable of building textures in finer details than before, which is something we've known for quite a while now. Having finally produced some frame-by-frame -frame objective analysis between DLSS and FSR, 
there are some definitive things that we can take away from this video. By the numbers, at 1080p, DLSS is the more stable upscaling technology compared to FSR. Though action does introduce complexity to the scene, DLSS is a bit better, at least with quality and balanced modes. At 4K though, both upscaling technologies perform far better than at 1080p, and FSR even edges out DLSS by a small degree. But a side effect, adding more motion to the scene decreases our scores. And as for performance mode, it does struggle here, but is far superior to 1080p. But there's a glaring point here, guys. Each of these scores is a prediction towards a subjective result. So all of these results are really up to the user. A score of 80 in 4K is deemed excellent, but is 74 much worse than 78? Both are technically good, but only a user can answer the question if one is better than the other. The VMAF tool predicts a consumer subjective classification of a scene. Some picky viewers may see a difference. Others will say that it looks good enough. This has always been a problem for the DLSS versus FSR comparisons, but at least we have an algorithmic representation to reinforce our opinions. Now, as much as I want to call this video done, I have to address the flaws inherent to this video. First, VMAF was never really intended for this type of comparison. It is entirely possible that what VMAF determines as bad, it really isn't what DLSS or FSR impacts. VMAF predicts a user's subjective opinion of Eclipse encoding quality that may or may not be quantified similarly for FSR or DLSS. Next, my recording capabilities have gotten better from previous videos, but they are far from perfect for this type of analysis. I'm still learning a lot about the tools required to capture, edit, and sync lossless footage, and that of course takes a whole lot of time. Also, finding scenes that sync well and can be used for analysis is very time consuming, and it requires intricate knowledge of the game, rendering technology, and limitations of the VMAF tool itself. With all that said, I have loved putting this video together for you guys. It has tested every aspect of my technical know-how in order to present to you guys what I think is a pretty good starting point for this type of exploration. And with that said, what do you guys want to see next? Should I refine my workflow and look for more games? Or should I use this tech for other types of comparisons? Let me know down in the comments. I really want to hear what you have to say. And since you're here at the end of the video, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to get to 10,000 subs by the end of the year, and I can only get there with your support. But thank you guys for sticking to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Later.